All right, but other than that, uh, I will stop sharing. And are you ready to take over, Leslie? Let's do it. All right. All right. Bear with me while I get everything set up here. Can I get a thumbs up if you can see big uh, gradient slide? Amazing. Okay, so cool. Uh, let me get my little thing set up so I can see your faces. Amazing. Okay, hi. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about spreading the jam, um, getting started with the jam stack, specifically using two tools uh, that I really like, Gatsby and Netlify Forms. And we'll get into a lot more of what all those buzzwords mean in a second. So if those don't mean anything yet, uh, don't worry too much. Uh, before we dig in, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so hi, my name is Leslie Conewine. Um, I, even before COVID, was working remotely uh, from Dallas as a front-end engineer at Netlify. Um, Netlify is a platform that helps you build, deploy, and manage sites and apps that are built using this Jamstack architecture, which we'll talk a lot more about. So it's a really good place if you're building a site in this way or an app uh, using this architecture, Netlify is a really good place to, to host it. Um, and also as a caveat, I'm talking about that a lot, but I also work there. Um, so I started my development career uh, in New York City, actually, working at digital agencies. So I worked with clients like Nintendo and Jerry Seinfeld and got to build all sorts of fun sites for them. Um, and in those jobs, I was really used to having to bug backend engineers all the time uh, to like do all of this back and forth in terms of like, you know, they're setting up this content management system for the uh, for the client and I'm working on the front end views and I'm doing animation and complex, all sorts of like interesting UI things. And then obviously those two things have to connect up. So, you know, the backend engineer passes along their work. I'm wiring up the front end view. Sometimes we have to go back and forth. Maybe, you know, the we need to adjust the validation on a field in the CMS so that, you know, we don't have too many characters in this one text area that looks really bad on the front end. So there's like this constant process of kind of back and forth between front end and back end. And then on top of that, in this agency world, I was bugging our DevOps people or our IT engineers or whoever they were, because I would need a staging environment. And then I would want to test my changes somewhere to be able to share those with the client. And often that would sort of end up falling on the front end because it was sort of like, okay, I'm sort of the last step. I've got everything wired and looking good and ready to actually show our clients or our customers. Um, and so here I am having to like bug our uh, SREs or DevOps or whoever they are to get everything set up. Um, and for me, that whole process, I'd done that for several years as, as an engineer um, you know, at agencies and it seemed like there should be a better way. Um, and that's sort of where the Jamstack comes into my story. Um, it, I sort of found this new model, uh, experimented with it a little bit, started building some sites with this new architecture and found that it cut out a lot of those extra steps. So again, we'll get more into that, but the reason I care about the Jamstack and talk about it a lot is because I actually went through this process of seeing how it made at least my life better um, and how I was building things. So that's sort of what got me interested. Um, You'll see sort of my path here. I was born in Austin, um, went to Denver, lived in Australia for six months, NYC, and then to Dallas. So I've been a little bit all over. Um, and another thing that I always like to call out is I care a lot about web accessibility. So that's another like passion area of mine. If that's an interest of yours, we should definitely talk. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about this whole Jamstack thing and what it actually is. So Jamstack itself is an architecture more than it's an acronym. Some people see this and they think, oh, JAM, J-A-M, like that means something. There's an acronym, there's something that stands like behind this. Very similar to like the LAMP stack or the mean stack. These are things that, you know, as engineers are all sort of familiar with those terms. Now JAM does stand for something and I'm gonna talk about what it stands for, but I want you to go a little bit beyond the acronym with me here because it can be really easy to say, I'm gonna just grab onto what those words mean, what those letters stand for. Um, and not think at sort of the higher level. So we're going to talk about the acronym, but don't don't hold me to it. So there's three kind of main parts to what a Jamstack architecture looks like. The first major piece of it is some sort of JavaScript. So usually what that is, is it's the client side functionality. So very often when we're talking about Jamstack, you're going to be using some sort of framework or uh, technically their libraries, something like React or Vue, um, potentially Angular. Um, but you can also use like vanilla JavaScript, jQuery. There's all sorts of things that fall under this JavaScript umbrella when you're talking about Jamstack. So that's sort of like element number one. And when we say Jam uh, JavaScript, you'll, we'll get into the markup and the other pieces in a second. Um, so the next piece, the A in Jamstack, technically stands for APIs, right? Which, as we know, it's Application Programming Interface is what API stands for. Um, Jamstack sites use APIs to integrate sort of the data layer. 
So um, really any dynamic information that you're gonna have in your app or your site comes through this sort of A in the Jamstack. Um, very often, uh, what you'll see happen is that you'll have like data coming through to the front end via JSON. So you'll have basically all your data that's coming from some source. And again, we'll talk more about what those sources could be, but it'll come through and you'll have JSON and that's sort of how, what you'll use in your front end to stitch all of your, your data into your actual site or app. Um, and then finally, the last letter of the jam is markup or markdown or whatever flavor, flavor of markup related things that you would like to choose. Um, and this is really the presentation layer. So that makes up Jamstack um, at a bigger level. So those are just what sort of those letters mean. Uh, but you might be saying, well, what about like CSS and what about other front end technologies and what about testing and like, why are all these things not mentioned in this, this little acronym? So um, the bigger picture of Jamstack is that it's a decoupled approach to web development. So it's very much a separation of concerns for your front end and your back end. Um, the front end very often in a Jamstack architecture is gonna have its own repository and that repository is very often going to have JavaScript and markup in it. So you get the, the J and the M in there, right? Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to use that API layer, the A, um, to essentially like reach out and connect to your backend. Um, so your backend could be a lot of different things. It could be a big monolithic backend that you're talking to. That's sort of how I work. Um, in my job, it could also be a lot of microservices. So very often with Jamstack, the A could be um, utilizing different backend systems, microservices to bring functionality into your site. So things like the Stripe API could be considered um, the API layer in a Jamstack site if you have a site where you're trying to, to sell something like for e-commerce. Um, uh, API could also be a headless content management system. It could be WordPress, it could be all of these things. But the main key here is that it's decoupled. So those things aren't all living in a big repo together, a big monolith where you have PHP and all your backend code with your front end code, it's very much your front end code is sort of this separate uh, decoupled piece that is using APIs to reach out and grab data from other sources. Um, and the key here um, is that all of this, all those pieces work together so that the app is ultimately pre-built into sort of what you think of as a highly optimized like static page. So what you end up actually serving when the user or customer comes to your site or app very much is coming to something that all of the pages have already been built ahead of time. So you're uh, not having all these round trips to the server. And again, we'll get a little bit more into that in a second. Um, one of the reasons that this is good and one of the reasons that can be helpful um, for certain types of sites and apps is that this process of pre-rendering results in sites that can be served directly from a CDN. Um, CDNs tend to be a little bit cheaper to host your site. They can scale um, sort of infinitely um, and manage that scaling themselves. You don't have to have someone like sitting on a server and making sure that load balancers and all of those fancy things are working properly. Um, and CDNs also tend to be sort of um, more on the, the secure side. Um, so anyway, all of this is to say that this Jamstack term, which some people think is like very trendy or whatever, uh, it was coined because the other alternative, the, the language we had been using for this was static site. But as you can see, like I've talked about all of these things already. We've talked about JavaScript and dynamic functionality coming in through APIs and that isn't really static, right? We think of static as something that's not changing. So that language and terminology was sort of outdated because the new static site doesn't really have to be static. It can be dynamic. It can have more of this functionality. So that's sort of where this Jamstack word came from. Um, it just wasn't doing it justice to call it a static site anymore. The word itself, I think, has been around for like five or six years. Um, again, to be totally transparent, I'm pretty sure that uh, the co-founders of Netlify are the people who came up with this term, uh, but it really has caught on and it's sort of something that a lot of people are now using to refer to this kind of style of site with. Um, I don't know if anyone listens to the podcast Syntax FM. Um, they call this BYOF, bring your own front end. So it's sort of like you can use whatever back end you want and then you can have your, you know, you can basically sort of skin your own front end however you want. Um, and Chris Coyer of CSS Tricks calls this whole model like the all powerful front end developer because it really does kind of give front end developers powers to build everything and even do some of this sort of what I used to think of as more back end work where we're talking more to the data layer and uh, stitching all the information together. You can kind of own a little bit more of that uh, with this model. So hopefully that acronym now makes a little bit more sense and it's less about the acronym, it's more about the architecture. So. Again, getting a little bit um, deeper into kind of what this actually means. When we talk about like a traditional website, so something that's not Jamstack architecture, 
um, what's happening is that you're fetching data at runtime. So your user is loading their page in their web browser. And when that happens, the request is sent off to be processed by a database server. So like the request comes in from the client and it gets sent away. And when that request gets filled, the web server itself, so the web server living off somewhere else is going to stitch the data response. So the information coming back from the database is going to stitch that together with HTML that you've provided it. And it's going to sort of on the fly assemble this dynamic view. So it's going to say, OK, here's your user information. And here's the HTML. I'm going to put those things together. And then I'm going to send that all the way back to the client or the browser. And then the user is going to see it. So you can see it's like this whole process, this trip. There are other steps in there sometimes, though. Uh, I like super simplified that. Um, so there could be a CDN layer as well as part of this um, that can help with caching, a load balancer to help distribute traffic to the right servers so that you don't overload a server, depending on who's visiting your site or app and for where they're located. Um, all of this is to say that ultimately it can create a slower experience for the user, right? Because they're waiting for the sort of round trip to the server to happen. Um, and there are multiple points of failure as well, and a lot to manage in between. All these servers have to like upkeep and maintenance and all those things. So Jamstack workflow looks a little bit different. Um, instead of fetching the data at runtime, you're primarily fetching the data at build time. Um, and again, primarily is important. It doesn't mean always. Um, the content can live kind of anywhere. It can live in a content management system. It could live in WordPress. It could be in markdown files right within your repository or it could be pulled in via these like third party APIs that we've talked about. Um, but instead of waiting, of the user kind of waiting for the server to dynamically render the view and then send it back to the client, what Jamstack does it is, is it offloads that wait time for the user onto the developer. And the way it does that is by using this build step. So essentially, instead of the user sitting there waiting, when you are releasing a new version of your site or app, you are kind of eating that time by having this uh, process, this build process, where everything gets stitched together on your time before it gets deployed. Um, the build step, the cool thing about it is that it can be like fully automated with continuous integration. So you can have this hooked up to your Git workflow and you can make all this stuff sort of magically happen. You can commit to Git and have it automatically kind of deploy your site. Um, it gives you some, uh, the, the downside of having the build step uh is somewhat tempered by the fact that there's all these cool tools that make it a lot easier uh to to sort of hook into it um so again then when this page comes back in jamstack model the page is loading in the browser and the request is basically instead of going off to the server and doing all those steps is just going right to a cdn uh probably the one that's like physically uh near you uh has a pre-rendered view of the site and it gets sent back to the browser so it's a much faster sort of process um and the advantages you get from that are many um so why why do we do this uh why is this like new model catching on um because of the way that it works that i just walked through in terms of missing that server step um one of the big things that you get out of it is actually better performance for the end user right which is what we're all after is a page loading really fast for your user so that they stay on your site and do whatever it is that you're trying to get them to do um so the, the whole CDN approach and the fact that we can serve everything right from there without having that uh, server layer means that you know, sites are, are usually very fast, assuming you're keeping your JavaScript bundle size down, which is another topic we will discuss maybe at a different meetup. Um, the other cool thing about performance and, and with Jamstack, it makes it a little easier to like, get really good Lighthouse scores. So if that's something you care about and you, you know, are wanting to monitor performance or performance or metrics that you're kind of looking at with your clients, um, Jamstack can, can really help you leverage that. Um, other reasons Jamstack is great, um, scalability. Generally, uh, sites that are built in this architecture are a lot cheaper to host. Um, there's no server maintenance. Everything can kind of scale magically because you're using CDNs. The CDN is going to compensate for more visitors. So you get a bunch of traffic on a Jamstack site. You're not going to have to worry about your site going down in the same way that you might um, if you are sort of following a more traditional workflow. Um, in general, um, there's fewer security risks because uh, you're not worrying about server or database vulnerabilities. Of course, you have to keep like your JavaScript packages up to date. There are still things to consider. Nothing is perfect. Um, you still have to build your, you know, what you're building in a secure way. But in general, it takes away some of the unknowns uh, kind of beyond the code that you're writing. Um, for some people, it's a better developer experience. For some people, it's not. Um, for me, as a front end engineer, it was like, ooh, this is so powerful. I can set up my own CMS and hook all the things together. And here I've made this full stack site without having to touch 
backend code. All I've touched is JavaScript, which is something I know and feel comfortable with. So for me, it was like, ooh, this is so exciting. Um, it's not for every project, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but for me, it was like a really good workflow. The fact that you have this continuous integration and continuous deployment model and everything sort of hooks in together made the whole process for me like the workflow was much smoother. And it cut out a lot of that back and forth with the backend engineers and the wiring up views and then working with DevOps to get a staging site set up. All of those steps that I talked about at the beginning have kind of um, been reduced or even in some cases completely eliminated for me by following this architecture. Um, yeah, and basically, uh, as Chris Coyer says, it gives front end developers superpowers. Um, but like I mentioned, nothing is absolute, right? This is not perfect for every project. This is not the architecture for every project. Um, and I think that's really important to know. Nothing is a silver bullet. You have to know what you're building and what you're trying to do with that to make the best choice about what kind of architecture you're going to choose, right? Um, so sometimes it can help to think about Jamstack based on what Jamstack isn't. So some things that it isn't. Um, are like a server side content management system that has like a built in theme. So like WordPress or Drupal, Joomla, Squarespace, um, those kind of packaged solutions are not what you would consider a, a Jamstack site. However, of course, there are always caveats, right? There are ways to use a REST API to bring content from one of those places. So you could have a WordPress instance that's hosted somewhere on WP Engine or hosted by some WordPress provider. And you can take content from a WordPress uh, site, basically the, the database in WordPress. You can use a REST API to pull that information into a completely decoupled front end. And that would be Jamstack. Uh, but using like a pre-built WordPress theme um, and hosting WordPress and all of it together, that would not be considered Jamstack. Um, so let's see. Uh, it also, um, let's see, sorry, catch up on my notes here. Um, yeah, and it's not a monolithic like server run web app. Um, in general, there are some cases where I'd say it's not great to use Jamstack. So a massive, massive site that has millions of pages, um, something like if you work at the New York Times and you have this archive that goes back however many years and you need all of those pages online, um, might not be a great use case for full Jamstack. Um, the reason for that is because that build step takes time, right? So if you think about how long it would take to build all of these pages statically, um, you would perhaps be waiting a long time every time you deployed. But there are kind of hybrid models. So um, hybrid models might be a really good fit for something like a new site. And we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Um, other cases not to use Jamstack might be if you have uh, if you have a really big team already, you have dedicated DevOps people, you have everything up and running, everything's great, you have really good communication and you have people to manage your servers and, and some of these other challenges aren't there. Um, and the project might require like really dynamic, highly variable content. Uh, all the time, that might be a use case that Jamstack isn't the best for. Um, and then like anything that would need super duper fancy dynamic features um, that you might want to customize a bunch. So like a site that needs like comments and payments and all of these things, and you don't feel comfortable using an existing microservice or other provider to do those things. So like using Discuss for comments or Stripe for payments, if that's sort of off the table, then Jamstack might be a little bit more complex to set up for you. Um, so hopefully that gives you sort of a better sense of when maybe this isn't the best thing to choose. Um, okay, so what are the ingredients of a Jamstack site? Oh, actually, before we get there, why not both? Um, so there's a kind of this school of thought where historically Jamstack has meant this very static approach, and then there's sort of like the server rendering approach, and those two things are very separate. And we're seeing recently more of a convergence of those two things together. Uh, for people who've been keeping up with React news, there's like React server components are a new thing. Um, so there is a lot of talk about how can these things kind of coexist in some cases. So there are opportunities to kind of marry these things. Um, there are frameworks that exist like Next.js, which is essentially a library that's built on top of React. So you write your site in React, uh, but Next sort of adds some additional functionality on top of that. And if you're creating a website or web app with Next.js, um, they offer dual modes. So they have server-side rendering and static site generation, and you can choose based on the page. So you can say this page, I don't have that much dynamic content, or I'm gonna, you know, I wanna build this at build time, but this page over here has like all of this dynamic content that I need to do all this fancy stuff with, and I want this to be more of a server-side rendered uh, approach. So there are ways that you can basically kind of marry the two, even in the same project. Um, some people are kind of calling this like hybrid Jamstack. 
Um, I might call it full Jamstack. There's the, the terminology we're still working through exactly what that looks like. Um, but know that you can have both. It doesn't have to be either or, and that Jamstack in general doesn't have to mean only one of those things. Um, another kind of piece of this is that a Jamstack way to do what we typically think of as server-side rendering might involve using serverless functions, which are another part of uh, kind of this Jamstack ecosystem. I don't think we have time to get too into serverless functions today, so I'm not going to talk about them, um, but you may have used them. They're very cool. Highly recommend if you're looking to add a lot more dynamic functionality to a Jamstack site or app. Okay, so now let's talk about what actually goes into how do you use this architecture? Like, what are the pieces that go into it? So um, first, we typically have something that we call a static site generator. Again, confusing term. It's not really about static. But anyway, um, what the static site generator does is going to help us with that build step to build all the pages of our website or web app whenever there are changes. Um, so often the static site generators are JavaScript based, but they don't have to be. Um, Create React app can be thought of as a stack site generator in this context, but some of the uh, popular ones are on the slide, Next.js, Gatsby, um, Nuxt, Viewpress, 11D is, is gaining some steam. So these are typically like the main tool you're going to use to actually start writing your code with. Then on top of that, you're going to have a headless content management system. And this is sort of that A in Jamstack, the API layer. So the CMS or sort of wherever you're pulling your data, the microservices, um, this is where your content is actually going to live. Um, I would say in general, like the field of headless content management systems have sort of exploded lately. There are a ton of options to choose from here uh, based on your needs. There are open source options. There are commercial options. There are free ones. There are like self-hosted. There's all of these options. Um, so some of them, again, offer free tiers, um, but they have everything from like really small teams working on these headless CMSs to like these big massive, you know, WordPress, which is this massive ecosystem that's been around forever. Um, and then the last thing that you usually have with a Jamstack site um, is version control of some kind. So we're all used to using Git. Um, the main players are GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket. Um, but those are kind of come into play for that continuous integration build step piece. OK, so this slide is a little bit overwhelming, but it shows how big this whole ecosystem actually is. Um, again, we kind of go through these same concepts, right? We have this presentation layer. So this is where we talk about our static site generators. You can see this is even a bit outdated. There's a lot that are missing here, and these are um, maybe now a year or two old. Um, but you can see how many options we have for kind of that presentation layer, how we're actually writing our front end code. Then we've got that API layer. We have all the headless CMSs I was mentioning, as well as these utility APIs that are only, you know, help you with one aspect. So you can have a site that uses WordPress for all of your content, but it has Discuss as a separate service for your comments. And then maybe you have a store as well on this website and you're using Stripe for that. So you can kind of pick and choose all these pieces and pull data from any of them um, and mix and match. Uh, again, uh, ideally you're using version control um, and storing your code in Git. And then uh, finally, you'll need a host for this type of site. Um, my favorite is Netlify, probably because I work there, but it's also the first Jamstack host that I had used and I found it really easy and approachable, which is why I liked it. Um, so, and then we're not gonna go too deep into that backend piece, but uh, again, that serverless functions come into play with sort of that backend layer. Um, so if you put all of these ingredients together, what do you get? Um, so let's talk about a real world example of building a, I'm going with sort of a simpler site, uh, but keep in mind that you can build web apps this way too. Uh, but a really simple example of a Jamstack uh, site would be like a portfolio website with a contact form, right? Um, a traditional form, if you have a form on your front end, you're going to need some sort of database to store the form entries. So your users type in on the form and you need somewhere to send that data and store it, right? Um, so typically you would need some sort of whole backend solution to build a portfolio site that has a form on it. Um, cool thing that Jamstack uh, has or offers um, are sort of easier ways to get around this without having to build a whole backend. Um, okay, but before we get totally into this demo and example, um, I want to talk through for a second the specific tools that I chose for this demo and this project. Um, so let's go into Gatsby for just a quick second. Um, I chose Gatsby as our static site generator. Um, because it's built on React. Um, and I use React every day. I think a lot of people are familiar with it, um, but I chose Gatsby. Um, again, at build time, Gatsby is creating this internal, sort of one of the cool things about it is 
Um, it builds an internal GraphQL server of all your data, wherever it's stored. So it could be Markdown, JSON, a CMS, wherever. Um, but all of your data is queried at build time through GraphQL uh, from your React components in a really consistent way. So some people think GraphQL is like a really great thing about Gatsby, and some people think it's really challenging and not so great. Um, but that's that's what it is. Um, one of my favorite things about Gatsby as a as sort of a static site generator or a Jamstack provider, whatever you want to call it, is that they have a really rich plugin ecosystem. So like if you're used to building a site with WordPress and you have a million plugins to choose from to add a form here or to do SEO for you. Gatsby has a lot of these sorts of um, plugins available. It's sort of like adding a JavaScript package to your site, uh, but it adds a lot of additional functionality without you having to like hand code all of that stuff. Um, I really like their documentation. I think it's clear, so it's it's a good place to start. And Gatsby also has a lot of starters, uh, which we're actually going to use one in the demo. But basically, it's a Gatsby site that has already been pre-configured and built. It often has like a theme baked into it, but you can sort of start it up from there, and it gives you all the code, and then you can build on top of it. You can edit all the styles if you want. You can change it. You can remove half the pages. But they have a bunch of starters, so it's sort of like a nice uh, jumping off point. Um, another nice thing about Gatsby in particular is that it's built with performance and in particular accessibility in mind. Um, Marcy Sutton, if you're familiar with her, worked at Gatsby for a while and, and made a lot of great strides in the accessibility area of Gatsby. And sometimes a Gatsby site, if you build off this instead of just React, you'll get some gains in accessibility just sort of out of the box because Gatsby has done a lot of work in making Gatsby sites uh, more accessible. Okay, so then let's talk a little bit about the hosting layer um, and why I chose Netlify. Um, so again, this it, a lot of people think of it just as hosting, but it does a little bit more than that. Um, first, it offers automated builds with a continuous deployment from your Git provider. So all you have to do is you configure, you sign up in this web app for Netlify, um, you create a site, you hook it up to your Git repo, and then it's automatically going to be hooked together. And anytime you can change your settings, of course, but anytime you commit uh, or put up a pull request, it's going to, first of all, create a deploy preview or a preview of your site. It's like a staging, basically a full staging site for the, your single PR that shows those changes. Um, and then when you merge your PR or if you merge your uh, branch into your main branch, uh, it's going to kick off an official deployment or build of your site. So everything is sort of all tied together. You can imagine how easy it would be. You merge a branch and you have a new deploy of your, your app or site. There's takes a lot of the pain out of all of the steps to get something deployed. Um, another cool thing about Netlify is their atomic deploys. So because of the way that Jamstack works, it means that you can roll back to any previous version. Um, so you basically get this list of here are all of my versions of my site that I've deployed. And oh no, there's a bug in the latest one. What do I do? Well, I can just click back to the build that was right before the last one that I did. And if it's working, you can basically say, I want to roll back to that. You click one button and that's now the live site. Uh, and you can then go off and deal with your bug and fix it and, and then hook everything back up. Uh, and so that has saved me quite a lot of times. <laughs> um, Netlify offers custom domains. So um, out of the box, you can get like a free URL that's your site.netlify.app uh, anytime you create a new site, um, but you can also hook up custom domains. Um, automatic HTTPS, this is a little bit more table stakes these days, but it wasn't a couple of years ago. Uh, but Netlify, when you create a new site, everything is sort of secure uh, by default. Um, I think it's pretty easy to use as a tool for deploying. Um, and there's a free starter team. So it's really good actually for things like portfolio sites or smaller projects uh, if you want to have a place to host those sorts of projects. Okay, so now that we're familiar with all of these tools and all of these words I'm throwing out, um, let's actually get started looking at building a portfolio site in Gatsby with a contact form. And what we're gonna do is the uh, contact form responses are gonna go live in Netlify. And it's all going to be managed via our uh, version control with GitHub. So, oh no, here, my uh, formatting broke. So let me pop over and I'll show you. Let me see if I can get that working, sorry. Got to click through all the slides, the formatting of the, no, the, the steps aren't working. Okay, let me see if I can pull it up really fast. Give me a second. I 
I need like hold music while I do this. You're fine. You haven't been doing it for too long. <laughs> okay, this is a really bad example, but it's because my formatting and my slides broke. But basically, I'm gonna walk you through the steps. All you need to focus on here, uh, assuming you can see my uh, code editor, hoping you can, holler if you can't, uh, but it's these four commands. So what you would do uh, to start, you just open up your terminal um, or whatever you use for your terminal and install the Gatsby command line tools. So that's this line right here, npm install globally your Gatsby command line tools. Pretty simple, that's all that line's doing. Then the next thing we would do is we do uh, Gatsby. We just unlocked the CLI tools here. So now we have access to this Gatsby command. We say Gatsby new, we give it a name. In this case, I'm gonna call it portfolio. And then I'm gonna go ahead and link it to this starter. Um, again, Gatsby has a million starters. If you Google Gatsby JS starter, you would get a whole list of these and you can get URLs. Um, so you could drop really any starter there, um, but that will basically create, it's gonna copy all the code for that repo into a new folder that you've named portfolio. Then we'll just change directories into our portfolio and we run Gatsby develop and we're gonna have a local version of this starter uh, available to us to build from. So, now let's see what that would look like. So I can actually just show you the starter without looking at the slide. So this is like what the Gatsby starter looks like. Um, it comes with like, the design is actually pretty cool of this one. So it's got multiple pages. The main thing to note is that there's this contact form at the bottom. So you can imagine you could customize this whole site to be your portfolio. Um, and then uh, we're gonna have this form that you're gonna be able to input your details and it's gonna send it to Netlify. Um, so in order to get the form set up properly, we're going to pop back into our code. So I think my slides are still going to be broken up. Yeah, they are. Okay. We're going to, we're going to hack this together by looking at my slides and over here. Okay. So what you would do. Yeah. So sorry, Leslie, do you mind um, just pausing for a bit? I think we had a participant that was trying to follow along. Oh, sure. Yeah, sorry. I'm not watching the chat, so. Um, You're totally fine. Um, actually, that might give me a second to see if I can actually pull this up in my code editor so you can see it better. So while we pause, I'm going to rearrange here. Actually, she wants to see all the terminal commands in the screen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me bring that back. I'll also fix the formatting and post the slides so that um, y'all can also have access to that after the fact as well. Uh, the slides are in the top of the chat too. So if you scroll to the top, you can click that link and take a look at those while you follow along. Do you mind sending it one more time, Carissa, just so that's at the bottom? so that they have it right there. Sure. Thank you. OK, so there are those commands on the screen as well. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next step, but feel free to slow me down if you need a little bit more time. And I'm sort of hacking together here. It's not as clear as my slides, so sorry, but it's not quite as nice looking as it looked there. but. Basically, so the next step is now, once you've run that, you have this Gatsby site running locally and you have this code in that local portfolio file. So you can just open that up in whatever code editor you want, that portfolio uh, folder that we created and you're gonna have all the code from this Gatsby starter and we can edit it however we want. So for this particular um, next step of what we wanna do is customize our contact form because uh, we wanna figure out how to basically allow ourselves to go ahead and accept form responses in this contact form. So if we go ahead and open up just the contact JS component in this Gatsby starter, we'll see that we have a, a form here. Um, and there are a couple of uh, additional attributes that you'll notice on the form that uh, may look a little different to you. So we've got data Netlify equals true. We have a name uh, for our form. And then we also have data Netlify honeypot called uh, set to bot field. Um, so the reason we have to add those things, uh, once the site is deployed to Netlify, Netlify has these little post processing bots. They're basically going to look through the, uh, 
final kind of compiled code for the site. And they're going to look for these uh, Netlify attributes that are on your contact form in order to capture those. Um, and the bots only know how to parse HTML. So we have to kind of give them a little help to make sure they can detect forms that are rendered with JavaScript. So again, all we really have to do is just drop data Netlify true. Um, we have to give our form a name because when we go into the Netlify dashboard, we're going to want a name to be able to associate this form with. So we give it a name and it's got to be unique. So if you have multiple forms on your site, you would name this, you know, something unique. And then finally, uh, if we want to take advantage of some of Netlify's built in spam filtering, um, we can add a honeypot uh, or some sort of captcha uh, as well. Okay, so it's pretty easy. The, oh, the last thing is this hidden input. So you're also, uh, if you want to host on Netlify and capture your, your form entries that way, you need to add a hidden input that isn't going to show up on the front end, um, but you have to give it uh, a value that matches the form name. And again, this is because we're using JavaScript. Um, this sort of gives Netlify that extra push just to be able to recognize the form and be able to capture your entries. But again, it's really like one extra line of code um, and it's very well documented and pretty easy to follow. So um, before we actually deploy our site, um, the last thing we need to do is just hook our local code up to a GitHub repository so that we have the code that lives in GitHub. And sorry, let me get figured out here. So this is just your standard um, terminal commands for Git. Let me pull those up for you. Sorry, I have like a million screens going on here. But basically, back in your terminal, in this folder where you have this site, uh, you're just going to hook it up to Git. And you could have done this as your very first step if you'd wanted, but Git init basically says, hey, I want to add Git to this folder that I have locally. I'm going to add all of the files in this Gatsby starter, as well as the changes that I made to the contact form. So you're basically going to stage those for commit. You can go ahead and commit your changes that you've made. Um, and then basically you pop into GitHub or GitLab or wherever you want to create your repository and you would go through the steps in GitHub and their UI to create a new repo. And then you just grab the repository URL and in your terminal you would hook it up here by doing your Git remote add origin and drop in your URL for your repository. You can verify it if you want to just double check that you've hooked up everything properly. And then when you push to your main branch, that's going to get all of this code that you've created and your starter pushed up into GitHub. From there, we now are going to look at what the Netlify side of this looks like. So um, I'm going to actually go ahead and walk through this from beginning. So when it comes to actually hosting the site, um, you would create a Netlify account at app.netlify.com. Um, and then you walk through, you click create a new site, and then we walk through this flow to create a new site. Um, and they're basically going to say, go ahead and hook up to your Git provider. So in this case, if we'd hosted on GitHub, we would connect to that and it's just going to authenticate. And once you've done that, Wow, I have too many things open and I think I'm also running the Netlify app locally. So sorry, things are going all sorts of crazy here. But typically, we can go back and look at my little uh, video perhaps of how this works. But it's going to walk you through. You select GitHub, it hooks everything up. There you go. You're going to be able to choose your new repository that you created. Um, it's going to pre-guess your build commands and then you can just hit deploy site and that's really it. So you've done now all of the steps to deploy this website live. And from there, we can actually try it live. So we have this demo site that we can pop into um, and we can fill out our form. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And send the message. And for now, it's sort of sending us to this like ugly thank you page. You could totally customize that on your own if you want. Um, but that we've now submitted a form and without writing any back end code. Now I can pop back into Netlify and I can go find the sites.
and I could go to my forms page. And here I have this contact form because you might remember I named my form name equals contact. So now that's what it's named back here. And ooh, just a few seconds ago, here is my form entry as a user who had submitted a form. And again, in a typical site, you would have to have PHP and a database and all these things hooked up in order to allow yourself to capture form responses on, on a website, right? But here we've done this only with JavaScript. Um, and it was a little messy because the demo didn't go well, but it isn't that many steps. Um, and we were able to, to walk through it pretty quickly. So um, there are some additional things you can do from here. There are tools that you can use to um, set up notifications. So if you like you want to get email notifications every time someone submits to your contact form on your site, uh, there are email notifications and other things you can set up right within Netlify. Um, and there are like third party tools as well that you can use to do some automation. Um, so if you wanted to have another thing happen anytime someone responds to your contact form, you could use Zapier or another tool like that to uh, build some automation in. So going back to my slides here. So why, why does all of this really matter again? Um, we spun up this portfolio site with a working contact form with zero backend code and no database in probably about five minutes. If I was really doing this without trying to walk through it, it would have taken probably about that amount of time. Um, and Netlify and Gatsby were two tools that gave us the opportunity to do that quickly and efficiently. Again, using just our terminal, a bit of HTML and a little bit of JavaScript. Um, and we got to learn about this new architecture while we did it. Um, I think the most important thing that I like to impart is just that Jamstack doesn't mean you're stuck with this like static, unchanging site. Um, it means you're choosing all of those advantages I talked about at the beginning, performance, scaling, uh, developer experience. You're choosing all of those things by choosing this sort of architecture, right? Um, again, it's not for every project, but for projects where it makes sense, um, this is a, a really cool approach to take. Um, so in general, um, if you want to learn more about Jamstack, there's a lot of resources. Um, one that I would definitely put you to if you're new to this world is um, uh, this book, netlify.com slash O'Reilly Jamstack. Um, it's, a, I believe, an ebook, and it's available to download for free. Um, it was written by the Netlify CEO and co-founder and uh, our principal developer advocate, Phil Hawksworth, um, who I also should thank for creating a bunch of really good talks about Jamstack that helped me put together this one. Um, so that's a really good place to start. Um, the Netlify blog has all sorts of like Jamstack tips and, and other things um, related to the Jamstack world. Jamstack.org is a site that gives you basically all of this information in a nutshell. If we go to it right now, Basically, you'll see all the things I just talked about, right? Um, I use this to inform my talk, but also it's it's all true. So it kind of goes back over what is Jamstack? Why does it matter? Uh, what are best practices? What are the static site generators? Um, it's got a full listing of them. You can see a bunch of headless CMSs. You can sort them by type. Um, so this is a really cool uh, resource for basically getting started with, uh, with the Jamstack. Um, there's also a conference uh, related to all things Jamstack. Um, it's gone virtual, I think. I don't think we have details yet for this year, but um, there's a website so you can sign up if you wanna get details on that. And then finally, we have a uh, community.netlify.com. So if you do end up using Netlify to host and deploy and you need any sort of support or you have questions or you're running into problems, um, there's like a whole wealth of community and Netlify staff support uh, there if you need it. And finally, I tweet about Jamstack and other web accessibility and related things and front end. Um, and I write about them too sometimes. So feel free to follow me. Um, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to unmute and ask questions if you have any. Sorry, I can't see if anyone else is going to ask a question, so I'll just ask. <laughs> but um, so I know that you you work there at Netlify. Um, like, what types of projects besides like the typical like portfolio stuff, like things like that? Do you do you focus like what's your target focus? Like, what do you develop for like other ideas of things to use this tool for? I know that you kind of went over it, but. Mm -hmm just to go um, into a little bit more detail. Yeah, absolutely. So 
Um, for me, working in the agency world, uh, this model became really, really important to me. So agency sites, marketing sites, right, uh, were huge. Um, I can share my screen actually again and maybe show a couple of things that I've worked on. So when I was um, in New York, uh, I got to build this site for um, World Pride Fest, which was super fun. The site is like, has all sorts of, you know, a lot of design elements, a lot of like UI is going crazy. There's SVGs that are overlapping other things. Like it was pretty wild to build. Um, and uh, there's an events page as well uh, where you could filter um, and search for specific types of events. Again, this event has passed and the site's a little bit less exciting. Uh, but you can see we have sort of fancy nav transitions and all of this is because we're using like a single page app architecture to run the site. Um, I think this one was built with Gatsby. Um, but again, one of the cool things here was that all of this data came from a content management system that I set up without a backend engineer involved at all. So I was able to build this and also build essentially a content management system for the clients to put their all their data in and I didn't have to talk to a backend engineer or involve one in the building of the project, which was pretty cool. Um, so that's one example. I think marketing sites are big. Documentation as well. Uh, the React JS docs are hosted on Netlify um, and a bunch of other popular uh, documentation sites as well. Um, but so this, again, these all sort of are in the same vein as websites. Um, the Netlify web app, if you've ever used it, is actually a Jamstack app. So the Netlify app itself that we just looked at where you can go and manage the forms and you can delete and change, you know, uh, form responses and you can change site settings and all of these things for the, the projects that you're hosting on Netlify um, is actually built in a Jamstack model. So um, again, I didn't get too deep into serverless functions, but there are ways to kind of leverage that to basically build almost a fully fledged like web app of any type using this architecture. Again, I don't want to say that that's you should go off and build every web app using this architecture. It's still, we're still working out some of the kinks. There are still challenges, uh, but it's it's possible. Has anyone built Jamstack things before or want to share anything that they've played with in this architecture? I know one person that's not speaking up right now. It's my husband. I just, I love Netlify <laughs> in general. I just want to say that much. Like it's so easy that you think you're doing it wrong almost. Like that's how I feel about Netlify. Which is a good thing. That's an amazing thing. Like you're like, isn't this supposed to be more complicated? No? Okay, cool. Yeah, I've used Netlify recently. I think during the pandemic actually. I was like, okay. Well, we're still in a pandemic, but in <laughs> the beginning of it, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna start using it to finally, cause I'm so behind. And it was so easy. I remember, I'm like, oh my God, I remember the days when like, you know, I used to use Heroku and then you have to actually like install Express and a bunch of things. And Lify was like so simple. I loved it. I love hearing that. There are other providers. I don't want to pretend like Nullify is the only one. Um, Vercel is another big one. They used to be called Zite. So that might be one you've heard of or familiar with. Um, and they're great too. Um, and follow a very similar model and offer sort of similar hosting and, and capabilities. Um, but again, geared sort of towards this Jamstack style um, architecture. What are their stickers like though? Can they compete with Netlify's? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know what the word is. <laughs> I know their logo is like a triangle. They're very like slick. Netlify is a little more fun. We have a, a very cute cat sticker. Yes, that I'm yes. Of. Um, and we have a swag store. If you like Netlify and you're interested in swag and our swag store was of course built with Netlify. So if you're interested in stickers, uh, I can drop a link to that as well. I, uh, I guess slid so the link to your podcast in there, the Smashing, Mag Smashing Magazine episode you did. It's really great. I recommend all of you listen to that. Thanks. And thanks for listening. Um, I go a little bit more there into like how we build Netlify on Netlify. So if you're interested in sort of like how you could use this architecture and build things that are a little bit more dynamic and more app-like, um, we talk a, a bit more about that uh, on that podcast. I, I think it's really cool that, oh, 
sorry, a question came in, but I think it's really cool that, like, you, I mean, not everyone can say the same about the places that they work for, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I, I love our software that I work on, but you are so passionate about it, yours, and it, it's really cool to see. I love that. So it says a lot when the employees are like, this is actually awesome. <laughs> I just feel like this talk is such like a, I don't mean it to be like a sales pitch for Netlify, but half the reason I work there is because I, I like saw the benefits in my agency life. It was like, I was used to building sites in a specific way. And I tried this different architecture when it was, I mean, this was a couple of years ago. So it was like very new then. And it gave me so much more power over what I was building that I was like bought in. So I'm like, I'm sort of a convert and now I work there. So I feel sort of, I don't mean it to be a sales pitch, but it really came from a place of like, I worked in agencies for like four years and this approach changed my whole, the way that I like approach my job every day and it made my life easier. So I loved it for that reason. Uh, I see someone posted in the chat, uh, does the Jamstack get more complicated when used with GraphQL, which is a great question. Um, I think Jamstack in general can be as complicated or as simple as you want to make it, depending on what tools you choose to use. Um, the main ingredients are sort of what I mentioned on that slide. It's some sort of static site generator, some sort of like headless CMS or data layer, and then Git. And really those are like the main, and then a host, right? But those are like the main pieces. And in terms of like what technology you use once you're in there, you could get as complicated as you want. You can add GraphQL. Yeah, sometimes you have other setup you have to do as part of that, right? So depending on what microservices you use, sometimes there are additional setup steps that you need to do, or sometimes there is provisioning some sort of database depending on what microservice or what sort of third parties you're bringing. In. Um, but in terms of like how easy and how does this fall into Jamstack, it's kind of your choice in terms of what it is you choose and, and how kind of complex you want to take it. Um, some people think that Jamstack also only means JavaScript, like you can only host React apps and you can only host Vue, and that's not true either. Usually, like you could host old, regular old HTML, you know, that have just a folder of HTML files that you, that you drag and drop or host up on a sort of Jamstack style. Um, of course, that doesn't scale super well if you're building something bigger, um, but it can be as simple as you want it to kind of as complex as you want. And feel free to hang around. Also feel free to head out, but um, I wanna say thank you all so much for coming and hanging out and chatting and learning about uh, Jamstack with me today. No, I'll be Thank hanging you. out. Thank you. Krista and I and everyone will be hanging out for a little bit. So if you want to chat about anything else, you are welcome to stay for a little while. Otherwise, we'll see you later. Thank you for coming and thank you for a great talk, Leslie. Awesome talk, Leslie. Thank you. Yes. I'm sad that we can't all